Welcome, Excellencies. Welcome, Dr. Gargash. Honored to have you with us here today. So I'd love to begin by asking you to expand on something that you wrote on Twitter the other day, that the Western system of values is not necessarily synonymous with human values, and that the history of mankind is based on the multiplicity of civilizations and cultures. I'd love to hear how that applies to our present challenges. Well, I, I, I think uh, Dr. Jashankar uh, mentioned uh, that, but more from a political context. I think that uh, it is extremely important that we value uh, political diversity, we value uh, cultural diversity, and I think only through this sort of process are we able to continue the communication that's important in uh, between countries. I think uh, we do share a lot of values as, uh, you know, as human beings living in, in this globe. But at the same time, we also have uh, various also uh, cultural uh, traits and cultural uh, diversity that makes this world mm. uh, such an interesting place. So I think it is extremely important as we move forward uh, not to superimpose values that are perhaps suitable for certain societies, mm. uh, and we're all fine with that. Give I me mean. an example about what you mean. I think in, in various things, I think. I think a lot of uh, uh, values about, for example, dividing the world into democratic states and authoritarian states. Mm -hmm. I think this is a binary view that just doesn't work because really there are so many shades of gray between this uh, end of the spectrum and that uh, end of spectrum. I think if you, if you, ac if you accept the concept of... Uh, uh, of respecting uh, diversity, then really that acceptance of diversity really cascades down to everything that you look into. So it's not a single example here, but really it's a call for the world not to look at uh, issues and look at uh, areas of interest in a binary uh, view. Interesting. We seem to be entering this new era of globalization. Uh, where at the moment it feels like bilateral relations are taking precedence over potentially multilateral uh, relations or alignments. I'd love you to each speak about what that means for your country and how you see it. Well, uh, <clears throat> I, I would uh, put it this way. We're going to give you a... Uh, let me put it this way. You know, we saw a certain kind of globalization acquired a great deal of momentum, uh, probably from the mid-90s uh, till about five years ago, five, seven years ago. A lot of it was propelled economically. It was facilitated by technology, very driven by investment. But it also created exactly the point which Dr. Anwar mentioned, a kind of globalization ideology. Mm. Uh, ideology that there is one globalization and there's one truth, one narrative, and a certain narrow set of people who will define what is right and what is wrong. And what happened was very interesting. Within societies, because globalization produced inequalities within societies, mm. uh, for example, you saw even in the United States, there was a hollowing out of the industrial economy. It created a backlash. It also created problems between societies. Mm. So you had actually a very interesting phenomena, I would say, uh, uh, certainly partly I would use Brexit and Trump's election as two inflection points here, uh, where economic globalization, technology globalization continues. It may be fractured, but it still continues. Mm -hmm. But nation states and societies and people who do not want to lose their cultural and other identities are actually reasserting themselves uh, and saying that, look, you know, I, I have a personality, I have a history, I have a heritage. I'm not going to let my lifestyle be determined by somebody who's sitting 
you know, uh, somewhere else far away just because they happen to be the creators of the narrative. Mm. So you are today, in a sense, having this very interesting uh, contest in the world, uh, uh, argumentation in the world about globalization. Uh, I think it's one of, right now, one of the most important mm. uh, debates. And, you know, when I spoke initially about rebalancing, we've seen political rebalancing. Many more states express political views. We've seen economic rebalancing. The GDP's share of global economy has changed. But to my mind, one of the toughest, uh, uh, you know, uh, disputations we are now entering is really cultural rebalancing, which is who gets to define what is right and what is wrong, what is normal and what is not, mm -hmm. what is correct and what is not. And I, I think today that's a very, very big issue in international relations. Interesting. Dr. Anwar, I, I'd love the, to, you, to give your view on this idea of, of bilateral relations versus a multilateral approach. Do you see that? Well, again, I think uh, every, I think uh, we can speak about, you know, and this is also perhaps, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a reductionism, so to speak. But we can speak about bilateralism, multilateralism, or we can speak also about a smaller multilateralism, which is also proving very effective today. I think uh, bilateral relations usually are easier to manage or more difficult to manage, depending uh, the trajectory that you are actually going on. But I think they are usually much more effective, of course. But they are not a replacement for multilateralism, because there are many issues, and I think climate is a good example where it just cannot be dealt with uh, bilaterally. But I think more and more, and I think here in things that we are doing with India, you can see that the, in some of the smaller relationships, and then you see this in the I2U2 as an example, you have the potential of agility and at the same time of effectiveness mm -hmm. uh, because you are not trying to move 30 states or 50 states or whatever, but you have uh, more or less uh, a much smaller number of states uh, that have a certain common interest in a certain area. So I think every uh, successful foreign policy has to work on all these uh, different levels because each level actually has its pros and cons. You know, if I could just mm -hmm. add to that, I mean, if I take India and UAE, I mean, we have to do our SIPA and take that forward. Mm -hmm. We do the I2U2, take that forward. But there would be other forums. I mean, we are in the Security Council yeah. together. Mm -hmm. we, are, we will be, they are chairing the uh, COP28. Mm -hmm. uh, we are chairing the G20. So it's a kind of today, you know, there's so many issues and so many variables and so many platforms. The truthful answer to your question is kind of all of the above. Mm -hmm. You've got to work every opportunity and every platform to get the best results. Well, let's take one of these examples and let's look in particular at COP27, uh, finished recently. I'd love to hear directly what went right and what could have gone better. We are looking at each other. <laughs> I, I will yield to my host as a matter of courtesy. Okay. As the host of the next well, I, COP. I think, uh, you know, the, uh, again, I look at it not as an expert in climate change, I look at it more from uh, a political, let's say, uh, perspective. So I think uh, COP, uh, I think the main, main thing was really the framework of addressing concerns of developing nations. Mm -hmm. Of course, we still have to put all the details and the working mechanism in place. I would say that this is the uh, big breakthrough mm -hmm. there. But on the other hand, of course, we know that we are slipping on commitments uh, that mm -hmm. were made in Paris. And I think uh, this is something that we do really need to work diligently to, uh, to, to, uh, together in order uh, to address that. So I wouldn't say that uh, w something went wrong, but I think that the international system is not as effective Mm. and as quick as it should be in addressing what we are really seeing, the effects and the ravages of climate as we move, uh, as we move forward. 
but definitely I think also what is extremely important and especially from the perspective of a country like uh, the UAE which is uh, quite uh, bullish and uh, working very hard on sustainable energy but is at, at the same time a hydrocarbon uh, economy uh, this realization that the transition is not going to happen overnight mm. and will also need for everybody to understand that it will need a parallel hydrocarbon support for mm -hmm. countries like India and like us and other countries that still need to develop their economies, address uh, societal uh, requirements in education and in, in, in housing and in infrastructure, etc. So uh, I think the big, big uh, takeaway has definitely been uh, addressing the concern of, uh, of support for developing economies. Mm -hmm. But we, need, we do need to move much faster. If, you know, uh, I could add to it, uh, uh, and it's not COP27. I, I think the, yeah. whatever challenges precede COP27, they will carry on beyond COP27. There are two parts to it, really. Uh, one is the climate action part, which is do you have the capabilities and the deployabilities and the efficiencies and the economies, really, uh, to put in place uh, uh, a set of, uh, uh, you can say, options out there or practices out there so that uh, our, our growth is greener. Uh, you know, my sense is that's much more about global business, about public policy, about mm -hmm. sharing, etc. There's the other part, which is the tougher part, which is climate justice. Mm. Uh, and the climate justice part is that the promises which have been made to the developing world, uh, essentially it's like those who are occupying carbon space <laughs> have kept promising that they would help others and frankly they've kept shortchanging the world. Mm. And they come up every cop with some, uh, you know, some new argument, some evasion, something which keeps kicking the can down the road. So the real problem you're facing today uh, is that uh, is the same problem we've had multiple COPs ago, which is that the developed countries are still not, I mean, I'm sorry to say, they're still not sincere mm. uh, about keeping, keeping uh, to their promises. And there is uh, growing frustration because the state of the world is obviously getting worse. Mm. So the more climate uh, events and emergencies you have, the more there's going to be the sense that, uh, you know, these countries are unwilling uh, and to walk the talk and then you know sometimes you have these very clever narratives which are designed to confuse so you suddenly will bring up a subject like this country is a big emitter you know that country may have a per capita emission which is one tenth mm -hmm. that of the rest of the world but yet you'll say well you know they are a big emitter so maybe they should step forward hello they, this was not the country which occupied the carbon space so somewhere people need to mm -hmm. you know be truthful about it and say, you know, who's really responsible for the global warming uh, and the countries which are or need to step up. I can hear an element of frustration uh, in your voice as you I speak. I thought it, it was an element of truth, but I'm prepared <laughs> to settle for your word. <laughs> so what should we be doing differently and how can we move to it? How can we move forward? Because as you say, it's happened year after year, COP after COP? Well, look, uh, the, the fact is, if on the one hand we truly believe this is existential, you know, how can you say it is existential and I don't have the money to deal with it? Mm. You know, either it's existential and you put everything you have or it's not and, and you're actually uh, sort of, uh, as I say, you're not really willing to walk the talk. Mm. Now the fact is, there have been other situations where countries have been willing to put up money. You know, they, so it's not like uh, there isn't the resources. And again, this idea that, well, you know, private financing, that's one of the narratives which emerged a little bit later mm -hmm. when, when people really didn't want to pay up. You know, private financing will take care of it. You know, private financing will follow. 
private financing cannot lead mm. governments have to lead multilateral development banks need to lead and this is one of the big issues i, th I think which a large part of the world is grappling with mm. uh, and uh, you know unfortunately much of that world is not heard today because the global conversations are very one sided there did seem to be some movement around the idea of reforming the Bretton Woods institutions and that seemed to come during the conversation. Would you say that that's true? Were you heartened by that? I would say it's something which needs to be done. I, I would uh, defer to Dr. Anwar here. I'm not, you know, I'm, I, let me put it politely. I think it's lo there's a lot of hard work ahead of us. Mm. Uh, yeah. right? What would you add? Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> So one of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Anwar, said that the world's failure to in invest enough in fossil fuels before cleaner alternatives can fully meet today's energy needs is a recipe for disaster. So what should we be doing differently now? Well, I think uh, we need, uh, there's several things that need to be done. I think first of all is we need to work collectively. This is a, not a national issue, it's a global crisis. So continuing to work uh, quickly, collectively is extremely important. I think at the same time, we need to move faster also. And I think part of it also is the climate justice mm. that uh, Dr. Jayashankar just spoke about. I think that is essential because various countries, you can't tell them because of climate, you can't also at the same time develop uh, not develop the inf infrastructure, the sort of social mobility, economic mobility mm. of your population uh, because you missed the boat. I think this is totally unacceptable in, in, in various ways. I think from our uh, uh, emphasis, we have been trying to also be realistic, while seeing that while we are all focused on, uh, on sustainable energy, taking a larger uh, part in the energy mix, we also understand, and I think this has been very clear in the last year or so, that there's a lot of turbulence that is affecting global economy mm. because there hasn't also been enough investment uh, in oil and gas. Mm. And I think this is also reflected. So I think both of these things need to, uh, to move uh, in parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, what I would like to say is we in the UAE uh, within the Middle East region have a very solid almost 15 years or more of believing in sustainable energy and the necessity of addressing uh, climate. We've been the first country to, uh, to, uh, ex to uh, uh, buy into the Paris uh, Accords. We have been at the same time uh, we have been also at the same time the first country with the net zero uh, results. We have invested heavily in solar. We have invested heavily in solar. Uh, we have various, various investments that show our uh, trust in this course that we are taking. And we're of course looking forward to COP28 and what we want to do in COP28 is to try and get out with a lot of actionable uh, mm. results in, in, in that uh, perspective. Interesting. I'll let you recover from your cough. You're all right. Okay. Uh, you said, I, you know, I would love to hear a little bit more, Dr. Jai Shankar, because we, we saw COP27, one of those places where India yet again is emerging <laughs> as a pivotal country between the East and the West, the North and the South. Uh, and we've also seen that in the G20 as well. And <clears throat> there's been praise for the Indian delegation, the G20, working really hard to seek consensus between Moscow uh, and the Western camp. And you've said yourself that the, the war in Ukraine is actually sucking up oxygen in, in Europe. I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, give that one. Uh, <coughs> sorry about the cough. Look, uh, I think <coughs> we have two big divides today. One, you could say, is a kind of east-west divide centering around Ukraine. Uh, one is a north-south divide. 
centering around development. And Ukraine is <coughs> also having an impact on, on development. So uh, I, I do believe a country like India uh, can, can play that bridging role, mm. not alone. I, I think a UAE, for example, can, in a sense, has also been doing some of it. So, so would some other countries. But there is the need today to bridge. Mm. That's Do you want to add to that, Dr. Anwar? Yes, I think uh, we all want to see a quick end to the conflict in Ukraine. And we all believe also that this conflict uh, is, will not end except political, politically and through a political process. I think it is in, the, in our interest to make sure that there is a political process that ends this conflict. But I think also that, at least from the UAE's perspective, I think we, our position on uh, the conflict in Ukraine has been a very principled position. I think from the, uh, why, you know, as a country, our size in this region, I think we uh, don't accept that conflict is resolved through uh, military means, and at the same time, we think that uh, in, the inter in this international system, sovereignty has to be uh, protected and sovereignty has to be respected. But while we're saying that, the devices that need to be used are political devices. It should be a political process that will resolve this. It should be a political process that will ensure that conditions following the end of conflict in Ukraine are not the sort of uh, conditions that will bring about another conflict in a few years. I think uh, only a political process is able to do that, mm. to address the Ukraine issue, but at the same time ensure that grievances do not bring about another conflict out of uh, the way that this thing has been resolved. So let's talk a little bit more about, um, about technology. You've both yes. mentioned the, the partnership between the UAE and India. Uh, Dr. Jaishankar, you've said recently that the rise of India will be deeply linked to the rise of Indian technology. And it is a tried and tested tool for spurring economic improvement. But technology nationalism can also be a challenge and a risk. And if you think about China, for example, potentially a case study in technology nationalism and its dangers. The COVID um, catastrophe in China might be argued to be uh, traced to their refusal to, we to accept Western mRNA vaccines. So I wonder how you avoid technology nationalism while encouraging technology growth. Well, again, I, I think uh, the UAE has uh, benefited from globalization and has benefited from a world that has been uh, more of an open, competitive, uh, trading, uh, and, and ideas, actually, uh, platform. Mm. So really, we do, we do look with concern uh, at the sort of technology nationalism that you have spoken about. But we understand that at the root of these concerns is political issues. These are not, at the root, are not technological issues. Mm. They are national security issues, political issues. And I think we need to accept that while this sort of tension is in the international system, there will be a ripple effect. There will be a ripple effect on how we uh, trade. There will be a ripple effect on how we uh, uh, invest. There will be a ripple effect on how we sort of work uh, in technology uh, collaborating rather than uh, always competing. This is a sort of world that we are moving into following the sort of uh, naivety of the early uh, globalism. It's not uh, a good place to be in, to be honest, but I think at the same time uh, there are political reasons, there are national security reasons. And I think for us, a country our size, in our region, this is a tougher world to navigate, but that's mm. the way it is, and we have to navigate it. Mm. Look, uh, 
I, it's natural technology would be nationally used. So we pretend <coughs> that something fundamentally changed. Oh, everything has fundamentally changed. Uh, there will be national competitions based on technological capabilities, different nations, different groupings of nations uh, asserting their influence or dominance or whatever you call it. That's, that's for real. That's the part which I said, the, the mm. constant competition among nations. But there are some real issues out there. Uh, you know, on the one hand, globalization is going to make us work collaboratively uh, because it's in our mutual interest. But if you come, say, to some parts, let's say digital technology, <coughs> there's a real debate going on today about trust and transparency, uh, about, you know, are all, all countries, all companies, all providers the same? Does it matter to you under which law, regulation, ethos, your mm. data is residing. I think we can't run away from those mm. issues. So uh, if you ask me, will we see, um, <coughs> in a sense, uh, uh, disputation, argumentation, maybe stronger in the technology world? Absolutely. I, I don't think it's a matter of prediction. I think it's already there. So we, we need to start taking positions. And it's not just nation states that have a, a stake in this game either. It's, it's companies as well, mm. right? So let's talk for a moment about the technological hegemony of some of the big Western companies at the moment. Vaccines or tweets, a lot of the intellectual capital for technology innovation is controlled by some of these larger Western companies. And in fact, Dr. Trishanker, I think you have over two million followers on Twitter. I wonder in your world, what do, in your better world actually, what do uh -huh. global technology <coughs> platforms look like? Yeah, look, uh, again, um, you know, today you have tech companies. If you took their market cap and uh, uh, sort of put it up against the national economies of countries, I suspect some of them may qualify for a G20. <laughs> you know, some of them Would are Would you that, welcome them? Uh, some of them are that big. Uh, so, uh, we, it's, it's again, these are new issues that are emerging. And in the name of, as I said, narrative setting, political correctness, we can't keep ducking these issues. It does matter. Uh, for example, I'm giving you now an Indian perspective. You know, do tech companies have the same rules when it comes to cooperating on, say, national security matters. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, which, which countries would they respond to, which governments would they respond to, which would they not? Where, which, which countries should they respond to? Uh, certainly countries like India. Mm. So, I don't know who else. Uh, I presume <laughs> they will respond to countries uh, in their... But, uh, you know, uh, what is, is there... Everything else, I'm not saying everything in the world should be regulated, but there are accepted norms and practices uh, and uh, uh, sort of operating ethos. So if, if really you have big enterprises which have monetized data through, um, through their particular models, uh, in the name of, uh, shall I say, uh, free freedom, would you leave them completely to decide what they should mm. be doing once they've reached that stage? I mean, there are some live controversies going on. I mean, I'm not getting into that, but you know that and I know that. Mm. So, so the idea that somewhere tech is neutral, tech is neutral geopolitically, tech is neutral within societies, it's not true. Mm. They've not been. Think about it. What does this look like from your perspective, Dr. Anwar? Well, again, I, as I said, I mean, uh, technology, uh, number one, is a great wealth pro uh, uh, creator. I mean, huge wealth for countries, for companies, uh, is being created for technology. Uh, I think at the same time, technology uh, provides uh, developmental leaps. Many countries 
through technology can actually uh, create a five or ten year leap because uh, they are big on AI or big on this or that. So I think it, it's definitely not neutral, as uh, Dr. Jay Shankar said. I think from our perspective, uh, I think what is important, the UAE, for example, this year, for the first time, hit uh, or is hitting uh, uh, half a trillion dollars in GDP. So we really understand this is our first time that we do hit this number, and for a country our size, to uh, have a GDP that uh, size uh, is quite extraordinary. But I think we understand also that to continue this sort of development, uh, we need to uh, invest in technology, we need to partner uh, in technology and, 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 and to navigate our way uh, right now along as with what you were saying is more technology nationalism. Mm. But I think that's the way things are and then we need to deal with it. If I could just uh, in, in a sense build up, build further on what both of us said. Uh, we, given the centrality of technology to our existence, to our businesses, to our progress, we are going to need to factor it in more and more both in governance and in international relations. Mm. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm giving you uh, the, the data side of it as an easy example. Uh, I think a lot of societies, I certainly would speak for mine, uh, today feel the need to be comfortable about trusted providers uh, when it comes to an area like telecom. Mm -hmm. okay. Similarly, there would be countries who would worry about cross-border data flows, you know, who's, who's handling it. Mm -hmm. Now, companies are obviously crucial, but all companies, you know, and all destinations and all societies are not the same. So, we have to, uh, you know, we, we can't make it a, a, a kind of a theology. Uh, that, you know, companies are safe and the problem is with the countries. Companies are part of a country. I mean, countries don't run businesses, mm. or at least most of them do, some do. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I, I think the whole, we are entering uh, this domain where, if I were to say the next 10 years, uh, the big arguments and the big, um, the big maneuverings are going to be around technology. Mm. It's going to be around data, it's going to be around chips, it's going to be around AI, it's going to be around space. I could give you more examples. Mm. So that's interesting because you mentioned in your opening remarks the cooperation between the UAE and India around some of these emerging, these other areas like space, like AI. Tell me a little bit about how that partnership you think will help you individually as well as, as form, create this new kind of globalization? Well, again, I would like to echo uh, Dr. J. Shankar's uh, enthusiasm, really, about the bilateral relationship. I think this gives me an opportunity to come and, and sort of uh, reflect on what has been really a wonderful, wonderful uh, trajectory of the bilateral relationship since 2015. What we have achieved in seven years has been remarkable. And I think, uh, you know, Dr. J. Shankar did not uh, perhaps uh, mention this, but I think leadership, really Prime Minister Modi's leadership mm -hmm. and Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed's leadership in this has been a major uh, catalyst here. I just thought everybody knew that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, to start with, this is a, a very historical relationship. And this is a relationship where we've always had the private sector ahead of the curve of government. I think right now, the government is giving the private sector a run uh, in, 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 in leading this relationship. And I think uh, what has happened is incredible. I mean, we, uh, since 2015, the milestones are just too many to sort of, of catalog, and they are all over. So what was really a good relationship, an excellent relationship, has become a strategic and fit for the future relationship, mm. if I can uh, describe it in that way. I mean, if you really think about it, SIPA, uh, I was speaking to uh, the Indian ambassador, uh, Sanjay Sudhir, uh, 
only last week and he was telling me we don't really have the official figures yet but we are seeing about a 30 percent increase in uh, trade mm. following uh, the, the signing of CEPA wow. in February and our target really uh, is to reach uh, uh, trading levels of 100 billion dollars with India these within, are with India 100 billion dollars this year yeah 100 billion dollars mm. with India so uh, really where can we get all that extra sort of uh, uh, you know sort of revenue streams so to speak in in the relationship I think technology is one of the major mm -hmm. things. I mean we're doing things in space we are doing things in oil we are doing things in food security you name it it's really across the board the UAE today I think is the 10th FDI uh, player in India today and I think this is quite mm -hmm. uh, significant but I think the the real or the real added advantage is what we do on technology if we are able to harness uh, technology uh, make sure that we can work together in various areas of technology within our bilateral and as I said uh, you know multilateral smaller multi multilateral forums I think you will see uh, that the remarkable achievements of the past seven years mm -hmm. were really peel in front of what we are really seeing in, in, a, in a truly, truly promising relationship. Interesting. We've run out of time. If one I, final yes. thought from uh, you. I'll give you two final thoughts. <laughs> uh, one, you know, uh, in this period when our relationship has been very strong, we've also discovered, for example, during COVID, uh, the, that house you know how firmly we stood by each other mm. stood by each other in terms of handling community we kept our food supplies flowing uh, the cooperation we had on vaccines so in a world where we are going to get more disruptions due to conflict or covid or, or climate or whatever uh, the reliability today mm. of relationship between india and uae i think sets it apart that's my first point the second point is you know the UAE is following its transformational path a lot of us here are familiar with it India is doing its own now it so happens that the two paths have the ability to support each other and kind of uh, accelerate mm -hmm. the other country's movement so when I look at the ambitions of UAE and the ambitions of India to my mind, there's a very strong convergence, and that's really where I see the future of the relationship. Can I just mention an anecdote, if you allow me? Uh, again, during COVID, uh, early COVID time, uh, Dr. J. Shankar called our foreign minister, and uh, he was responsible for the distribution of, uh, of uh, vaccines. And he called and said, you know, I'm looking and seeing that you have requested 200,000 vaccines from India. Are you sure this is all you want? <laughs> we can give you 2 million if you want. And I think this sort of, you know, this touches you because really at the, I think what has really happened to this uh, relationship is this reservoir of trust. I think mm -hmm. the trust that underpins any relationship really makes you do wonderful things and I think this is what we have Thank been you. doing. Thank you.